Welcome. I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Chilean born author Isabel Allende was nearly 40 years old when she wrote her first novel. After a career as a journalist and administrator, she became a literary star in what was then a man's world. As she told our reader Braver, she found that ambition early. You didn't want to be like the women you saw around you. You knew that in your heart at a very young age. I wanted to be like my grandfather, who had a car, who had the keys of the house, who had money, who made all the decision. I wanted to be him. How did the family react to you? I was a lunatic. Later in the show, Isabel Allende on her trailblazing writing career. You were really one of the first, if not the first, Latin American women writers to achieve international recognition in the mid-20th century. What was that like to know that suddenly people were reading not just your work, but the idea that you were a woman presenting this story? Well, there were several things that I think helped my book. One, that I was a woman in an all-male phenomenon that was the boom. I was called Allende when people remembered what had happened in Chile. Chile was still present in the world. From second careers to second chances, sea turtles are among the most endangered ocean inhabitants. A dedicated team of veterinarians and volunteers across the U.S. is working to rehabilitate and release these gentle creatures. Lee Cowan had a first-hand encounter with their efforts. Biologist Donna Shaver says this release is modern conservation in action. They take with me their hopes, hopes for the next generation. There are few privileges that I have ever been offered. Look at this. Quite like this one. How cool. Look, buddy, you're going home. We humans have not always been kind to the sea and those who dwell in it. All right, buddy, go home, bud. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Author Isabel Allende's first novel started as a letter to her dying grandfather she left behind in Chile after fleeing a military coup. She says that book helped her find her voice. And over two dozen books later, she continues to amplify strong characters and overlooked stories. Here's Rita Braver. I have the book in my head, the characters in my soul all the time. If anyone knows what it takes to capture a reader's attention, it is Isabel Allende. You need crazy people, and you need people capable of doing extraordinary things out of impulse or passion or, or courage. 80-year-old Allende has filled more than two dozen books with passionate and courageous characters. More than 74 million copies sold, translated into some 40 languages. Your women are particularly strong. They take over your books. Do you know any weak women, Rita? Not ones I really like. <laughs> <laughs> women and girls play key roles in The Wind Knows My Name, Allende's latest novel. There come from Germany boatloads of Jewish youngsters. Which draws parallels between Jewish children sent to safety by their families during World War II and Latin American children separated from parents while trying to cross into the U.S. The Jewish families had to make the horrible choice of sending their kids alone to save them from the Nazis, not knowing who would receive them on the other side. And when uh, we had this horrible policy of um, separating the families at the border in 2018, I, I, I immediately thought, of what those families had gone through then and how history repeats itself. Allende's own history is tumultuous. Her father abandoned the family when she was three and her mother had to return to her parents' home in Santiago, Chile. She had not been trained to work because she belonged to a social class and a generation in which women didn't work. She was stuck. You didn't want to be like the women you saw around you. You knew that in your heart at a very young age. I wanted to be like my grandfather, who had a car, who had the keys of the house, who had money, who made all the decision. I wanted to be him. How did the family react to you? I was a lunatic. I was expelled from the nuns at age six. 
So it wasn't an easy childhood, as you may imagine. She married, had two children, but always worked as a TV personality, journalist, and school administrator. Did you ever think what I really want to do is be a writer? I was afraid of to say that. I never thought that I could. There were no role models. The great writers of Latin America were all male. Then in 1973, her world was upended. Some thought there was a peaceful way to reconcile the nation's problems. The military did not. As the Chilean military seized power from the elected government of her cousin, Salvador Allende. And my country changed in 24 hours. Try to imagine what it would be if in the United States the armed forces attacked the democratic institutions the president would die in the coup, and then I learned that I was in a blacklist, I got out. She and her family would flee to Venezuela. I felt very unhappy, very frustrated. I was going to turn 40 very soon, and uh, my grandfather was dying in Chile. And I started a letter for my grandfather to say goodbye. The letter would turn into Allende's first book, called The House of the Spirits, published in 1982, a fictionalized account of her own family, Chile's oppressive class system, and the terror of the military coup d'etat. The novel became an international sensation, often called one of the most important books of the 20th century. How did the success of House of the Spirits change your life? It gave me a voice when I had no voice. I realized that this is what I want to do. Her life would change in other ways, too, as she left her first marriage and Latin America. You've lived in California for how many years now? Since 1987. And why, you know, you could live anywhere? Why? Because I fell in lust with a guy, came this here, he was living here, we married, stayed married for 28 years. But in 2015, I end a second marriage ended in divorce. Did you ever think you'd fall in love and marry again? No. Yet in 2019, she married attorney Roger Kukras and is comfortable talking about her own sexuality. You say, in candlelight, I might be able to fool a distracted guy who's had three glasses of wine and is not <laughs> intimidated by a woman who takes the initiative. <laughs> Yes. And, is and that true? It is true. Also, uh, and also help some marijuana. <laughs> marijuana blueberries. One blueberry and you can have wonderful sex. I shouldn't be saying this on camera, actually, but because I know that Roger's children will listen to this. <laughs> and though she can be lighthearted, Allende is still mourning the death of her daughter, Paula Freas, in 1992 at 29 after an attack of porphyria, a hereditary blood disease. She got the wrong medication. She got severe brain damage and died a year later. The proceeds from Allende's best-selling book about Paola helped launch a foundation, now run by Allende's son Nico and his wife, that supports groups trying to help young girls at risk around the world. And if you can save a few of those little girls, well, I feel rewarded. She also continues to feel rewarded by her writing. With no plans to retire, she comes to her office every weekday where she lights a candle and sits down at the computer, usually thinking and writing in Spanish. Is writing still hard for you or does it just flow? The, the process is always hard, but, but I know now, which I didn't know before, that if I spend enough time, I will be able to do it. And as for the impact of Isabel Allende's books on her readers, work that so often deals with injustice and suffering. In a way, do you think when people read your work that it might bring about change? It can happen, but, but I cannot plant those ideas in anybody's head. I don't change people. I just make people realize who they are. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from our chat with Isabel Allende, something you can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. I have a foundation that works with women and girls mostly, but children. 
As promised, here's more from Rita Braver and Isabel Allende. You have really studied what some of these women who come to the United States are fleeing in their own countries. What have you found? Well, I have a foundation that works with women and girls mostly, but children. And we have found that many women are running away from domestic violence, from gang violence, and from extreme poverty that forces often these women to be at very high risk. For example, they have to go for water, and, and they have to walk, uh, I don't know, five miles to get water. In the, on the way, they are raped when they go and when they come back. So they have to go in groups. Girls can't be alone. Any girl age 14 has already had some sexual intercourse that has been forced on her. So all these situations make women so vulnerable, so, so vulnerable. You know, even in your book, as deeply as you go into some of these subjects, you don't really come up with a solution for all of this. Rita, there is no solution, no easy solution. Why do people come to this country knocking at the door, asking for asylum? Because they are running away either from war, from extreme violence, or extreme poverty. And if you don't solve those situations in the countries of origin, they will still come, and they will still knock at the door. You were really one of the first, if not the first, Latin American women writers to achieve international recognition in the mid-20th century. What was that like to know that suddenly people were reading not just your work, but the idea that you were a woman presenting this story? Well, there were several things that I think helped my book. One, that I was a woman in an all-male phenomenon that was the boom. I was called Allende when people remembered what had happened in Chile. Chile was still present in the world. There were Chilean refugees all over. So there was also a political issue. All these elements helped to launch the book. And many people thought that it would be a one-time thing. Very fortunate because it paved the way for all the other books. But I wasn't very aware of the success. It has been a long road, I would say. Looking back now, this book is constantly called one of the most important books of the 20th century. What's it like for you to hear that? <laughs> I don't know. Who says that? A lot of different <laughs> critics. I, I <laughs> found it everywhere. Well, I'm very flattered, but I don't know. Only time can prove the value of a work of art or literature. That's the point, though. Yeah, well, Over but the years, this book continues to hold up, it continues to sell, it continues to be read. Yeah, well, let's see when I die what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you described it as being in a, quote, splendid moment of your destiny. Yes. How so? Look, I am healthy. I don't have to take care of anybody except my dogs and my husband, and that's easy. I have a purpose. I have a community. I couldn't be better. Up next, another chance at life. Welcome back. Warming oceans and man-made dangers alike threaten sea turtles along U.S. shorelines. Lee Cowan visited a few of the specialized rehabs, giving these extraordinary patients a fighting chance at returning to the wild. At first glance, this can look like a morgue. Okay. Sea turtles, limp, and motionless. But if you look close enough, what might look like a corpse offers a slow glimpse of life. Those turtles all washed up in Massachusetts on the windy beaches of Cape Cod Bay. They were nearly frozen to death. The turtles, especially today, 38 degrees, if that turtle sits out for, for two or three hours, I mean, it's going to die. It's just, it's just not going to recover from that kind of shock from the cold. The problem, though, isn't so much the cold as it is our ever-warming oceans. This has been the hottest spot for turtles, too, and uh, yeah. Biologist Bob Prescott. So we'll close it up. Director Emeritus of the Massachusetts Audubon Wildlife Sanctuary in Wellfleet says the Gulf of Maine, which includes Cape Cod Bay, is now one of the fastest warming bodies of ocean water in the world. Now, turtles like warm water, but 
they're staying up here too long. By mid-November, the temperatures start to drop too fast for these cold-blooded reptiles to handle. And volunteers are finding more and more of them washed ashore. You see the movement in the flipper? In a hypothermic state like this. How's he doing? Can you tell? Uh, this time of year, you can't tell. It's called cold stunning. They may come in looking dead, they revive, they go to the aquarium and a couple of days later they crash. We'll put them in the box and that'll start to get them stabilized. All sea turtles are in real trouble, but by far the worst off are these, Kemp's Ridley turtles, the most critically endangered sea turtle in the world. Since the 70s, they've been washing ashore, about a few dozen per year. The first turtle I found was 1974. But these days, Prescott says, now, you know, we're up over 750, 760 turtles and started um, a month ago. They've traveled a long way, unwittingly into danger. Their nesting grounds are thousands of miles to the south along the warm beaches of the Gulf of Mexico. What we're looking for is the tracks left in the sand. And Where Donna Shaver has spent her life trying to help the species rebound. If we don't help save this species, we lose a piece that enriches us. How big are the eggs themselves? Like a the eggs puzzle. are about the size of ping pong. She's the head of the turtle rescue group at Padre Island National Seashore in Texas. There's a whole variety of things that can harm them, from oil spills to boat strikes to red tide, to entanglement in debris, ingestion of debris, all, all of those. Which is why all that urgent care they're getting back up north all right, little buddy. is more important than ever. Let's get your picture taken. Most have at least some degree of pneumonia. There's definitely a little bit of fluid in the lungs here. Some are so bad they have to be put on ventilators just to breathe. But they're also suffering from a lot of other things, fractured bones and dehydration, for example. He's OK. He came in yesterday, so he's still pretty early in the treatment process. This is the Animal Care Center for the New England Aquarium a state-of-the-art facility just outside Boston that specializes in treating cold-stunned sea turtles from Massachusetts to Maine. They have an 80% success rate at bringing these turtles back from the brink. It's moving a little, huh? This Kemp's Ridley came in with barely one heartbeat a minute. Anything? No. But biologist Adam Kennedy says for such a small marine turtle, they are remarkably resilient. Because of this, they will likely give another round of epinephrine, probably atropine as well. Treatment can last up to two years, but Kennedy can really only manage between 40 and 80 turtles long term. And with the warming waters, hundreds are now getting trapped every year. And that's just too many four flippered patients for any one rehab to oversee. It's basically a mass casualty event. They need other hospitals to help. But that left Bob Prescott with a question. How do you get a turtle from here to there? The answer, give turtles a ticket to fly. A happy reptile makes for a good passenger. <laughs> Ken Andrews is vice president of a unique nonprofit called Turtles Fly 2. This is in a lot of ways like a life flight. It is a life flight. It's a medevac flight, absolutely. Turtles may not be meant to have their heads in the clouds, but there really is no other option. There's no agency, there's no staffing, there's no funding, there's nothing there to make this mission happen, and these turtles will die if somebody like Turtles Fly 2 doesn't jump in to help. It could never happen unless hundreds of pilots were willing to volunteer their time, their planes, and their fuel to rush the rescued turtles to willing rehab facilities all around the country. Where do you guys get your funding? Yeah, what funding? <laughs> I, I yeah. wish. We desperately need it. Our pilots that are flying these missions are pulling a million dollars out of their pocket to fly these missions every year for us. On this particular mission, Ken, with his dad as co-pilot, will fly more than 2,000 miles from Boston to Atlanta, then on to Gulfport, and finally Dallas, dropping off 44 sick sea turtles along the way in hopes that one day they'll be well enough to be released. All right, I've got some temps for you guys. Ninety percent of the turtles that we've moved to rehab have ended up back in the ocean. Wow. Yeah, overall, everything looks good. All right, good, buddy, get out of here. <laughs> These lucky passengers landed at the Texas Sea Life Center 
in Corpus Christi, Texas back in 2021, courtesy of Turtle Sly 2. Could you do this without them? We could not do this without their help, no question. You're ready to go, huh? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Veterinarian Tim Tristan, the director here, says it took a while, but with good care and the help of volunteers, these turtles are now finally ready to go home again. If they can make it through our front door, we have a pretty good success rate with getting them turned around and getting them back out to the wild where they belong. You seen a sea turtle before? A crowd gathered at the beach of Padre Island. Oh my gosh, they're so beautiful. Most never get to see a Kemp's Ridley turtle. There are far too few. Everybody wants to see some turtles released, right? Yeah. All right. But on this day, there were a few more. Biologist Donna Shaver says this release is modern conservation in action. They take with me their hopes, hopes for the next generation. There are few privileges that I have ever been offered. Look at this. Quite like, like this one. How cool. Look, buddy, you're going home. We humans have not always been kind to the sea and those who dwell in it. All right, buddy, go home, bud. But on this day, it was human. Certainly not me, but the hundreds of veterinarians, biologists, volunteers, and yes, pilots, who all came together to give these critically endangered sea turtles <laughs> what they rarely get, a second chance. Who says you can't go home again? I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.